Hello. In this uh, video, I'm going to be looking at how to use your uh, detailed learning objectives and your soft chalk lessons to prepare a study guide for your lecture exams. We're also going to show you how you can use the soft chalk lessons to answer the think, pair, share, or TPS questions. And finally, I want to show you how to use the concept maps that you can use to review and to study for exams. So here we see a typical soft chalk lesson. This is our third lesson in unit one, and it deals with the peptidoglycan cell wall in bacteria. So don't forget, uh, at the beginning of every soft chalk lesson, we have bullet points and objectives. So remember the bullet points or fundamental statements are kind of like the highlights of what we're trying to cover in this particular lesson. For example, to give you a list, list a few, the vast majority of the domain bacteria have a rigid cell wall composed of peptidoglycan. The peptidoglycan cell wall surrounds the cytoplasmic membrane and prevents osmotic lysis. Peptidoglycan is composed of interlocking chains of building blocks called peptidoglycan monomers, et cetera. So those are our bullet points. And you always want to start the lesson with reading those bullet points. So you become familiar with some of the words we'll be talking about. But of course, what you really want to concentrate on are the detailed learning objectives for this lesson. As I've mentioned a number of times now this semester, your exams are based on these detailed learning objectives. This tells you what you need to know in each soft chalk lesson. So what most successful students do is they write out these detailed learning objectives. Then they go through the soft chalk lesson. And as they go through it, they answer the detailed learning objectives. Along the way, they also see if they can work out the TPS or think pair share questions that we see in many of the soft chalk lessons. And then after you have that prepared, you can use that and go over it, go over and over it again until eventually you can state the detailed learning objective, close your eyes and just answer it. So a lot of this is preparing your study guide using these detailed learning objectives, then lots of repetition to learn that well enough where you can do well on an exam. So what we're going to try to show you how to do here first is how to answer the detailed learning objectives. And it's fairly straightforward. Now let's take a look at the first of the objectives. Now I've chosen this particular soft chalk lesson because it's a fairly short one compared to some of them. So this video won't go on forever. And it's uh, pretty well organized showing you how you can uh, use the soft chalk lessons to answer the detailed learning objectives and how you can use them to answer the TPS questions. And it also shows you the concept maps you can use to review and reinforce. So our first objective here is state the three parts of a peptidoglycan monomer and then state the function of peptidoglycan in bacteria. So if we took a look at that second half here, the function of peptidoglycan in bacteria, if we go to our table of contents, we see that one section is the function of peptidoglycan. So if we go to that part of the lesson, and of course, we've seen you've kind of already gone through the lesson once and you're somewhat familiar with it. So under function of peptidoglycan, it tells you uh, the beginning that with the exception of mycoplasmas, which are the only bacteria that don't have a cell wall, the bacteria in the domain bacteria, which are the ones we take up in this course, with just a few exceptions, have a semi-rigid cell wall composed of peptidoglycan. That's simply the name of the substance that makes up the cell wall, just like cellulose is the name of the substance that makes up a plant cell wall. And right here, we have the answer to the second half of that objective, the function of peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan prevents osmotic lysis. Now, this relates to what we learned in the previous soft chalk lesson on the cytoplasmic membrane. This would have been the lesson prior to this one. And during that lesson, when we get there, you'll be going through osmosis again. And you'll be learning that bacteria concentrate their nutrients dissolved in water as solute through active transport. So they're constantly bringing solute into the cell. And so as a result, the cytoplasm of the bacterium 
uh, is hypertonic to its surrounding environment. The environment in this case that the bacterium is in is hypotonic, less solute, because the cytoplasm is hypertonic, has more solute. Well, in a hypotonic environment, water flows into the bacterium. And without a rigid cell wall, it'd be like a balloon being filled with water, it'd get bigger and bigger until it burst. So without the strong peptidoglycan cell wall, the bacteria burst from osmotic pressure from water flowing in because they normally live in a hypotonic environment. So there we have the answer to the first half of that first objective. And the other part of that first objective was to name the three parts of a peptidoglycan monomer. If we go back and look at that. So if we go here, we see structure and composition of peptidoglycan. That's where we'd find that. And it reminds you that peptidoglycan consists of interlocking chains of identical peptidoglycan monomers. So that a peptidoglycan monomer is the building block of peptidoglycan. And as we see in the next sentence, a peptidoglycan monomer consists of, to answer the objective, two joined amino sugars. We call them NAG and NAM, which is good enough for us. Uh, NAG stands for N-acetylglucosamine, NAM for N-acetylmuramic acid, but that's kind of a mouthful. And coming off the NAM are five amino acids, a pentapeptide. Remember, peptide is a short chain of amino acids. Penta means five. So there's the answer, and here's a visual to show you that. So there's a peptidoglycan monomer. Uh, so as we said, it's two amino sugars. They're called amino sugars because they both have an NH or an amino group on them. So here's the NAG, one of the amino sugars. That's connected to the NAM. Coming off the NAM are five amino acids or a pentapeptide. So there's the building block of peptidoglycan. And then these monomers join together to form rows of sugars. We see that in this illustration. So here's our monomer, NAG, NAM with a pentapeptide. And so here's one monomer in a row of sugars. Here's the next monomer in the row. There's the next monomer. There's the next monomer. So this is one row of sugars. This is the next row of sugars. This is the next row of sugars. This is the next row of sugars, etc. Uh, you will notice uh, as you go through this unit that when the monomer is joined, it only has four amino acids. It loses one of the amino acids in the process. So these are the rows of sugars, but then what connects one row of sugar to the next and makes the cell wall strong is called a peptidoglycan crosslink. So if we go back to our little description here, uh, the monor monomers of peptidoglycan grow in long chains. Those are the rows of sugars, but then each row of sugar is joined to the next row and each layers can join to the next layer by these peptide crosslinks. And that's what makes the wall really strong. It makes it similar to a molecular chain link fence around the bacterium where every component is tied to every other component by the, um, these peptide crosslinks. And again, looking at the visuals helps you to visualize that. So we see that this row is connected to this row by this short chain of amino acids, this peptide. And this row is connected to this row by another short chain of amino acids. So each monomer is connected to the next monomer in the row. Each row is connected to the next row by these peptide crosslinks. Each layer is connected to another layer also by these peptide crosslinks. <coughs> Excuse me. And that makes for a very poor cell wall, but a very strong cell wall, like a chain link fence. Now let's take a look at our next objective. Now, as I mentioned early on in the semester, remember some of these objectives have a single asterisk, some have two asterisks, some have none. So as we pointed out previously, a single asterisk, like in number four and five here, means it's a common theme throughout the course. In other words, 
we have to know the answer to this throughout the semester. It's something we'll use over and over again. Uh, if there's uh, two asterisks, like we see under number two, that means not only is it a common theme, but we have to know that in more depth. This often indicates a process that we have to understand. And that means there'll probably be multiple test questions on a double asterisk objective. And that's the next one we're looking at. <clears throat> so it says, briefly describe how bacteria synthesize peptidoglycan, indicating the role of autolysins, bactoprenols, transglycosylases, and transpeptidases. So we're making peptidoglycan. Here's the four things we have to learn about. Autolysins, bactoprenols, transglycosylases, transpeptidases. So let's look at our table contents where we have synthesis of peptidoglycan. And this reminds you the beginning that bacteria divide by binary fission where one cell splits in two, but at that point, they're only half their normal size. So before they can divide again, they have to grow full size once again. And to do that, since they're surrounded by what is basically a molecular chain link fence, they have to put breaks in the peptidoglycan so they can insert new peptidoglycan monomers in order to grow. So they have to put breaks in the cell wall, they have to insert new monomers, then link them all back together again very quickly before the cell can burst. And remember the first thing in that objective says state the role of auto license, which we see right here. So lice means to split, auto means self. What they're doing is they're, the bacterium is splitting its own peptidoglycan. Now the bonds that connect one peptidoglycan monomer to the next are called glycosidic bonds. Glyco refers to sugars, that might help you remember it. So that's connecting the sugar of one monomer to the sugar of the next. So those bonds have to be broken so that a new monomer can be inserted in the row. But they also have to break the peptide cross bridges between the rows of sugars. And that creates a molecular space so that a new monomer can be inserted. So let's see what the autolysins are doing in terms of breaking the glycosidic bonds and breaking the peptidoglycan cross bridges. That's the answer to the objective. And again, you want to use the visuals. There's a slideshow that shows you this process. But then I have this uh, fairly nice animation that will show it too. Once we get past the labeling. So in this animation, this is the cytoplasm of the bacterium. This is the cytoplasmic membrane. And this is the peptidoglycan cell wall on the outside of the bacterium. And of course, this is the environment out here. So here's our row of sugars. Here's one peptidoglycan monomer connected to the next peptidoglycan monomer, connected to the next peptidoglycan monomer. And these are two rows of sugars connected by these peptide crosslinks. <coughs> Excuse me. So to grow, the bacteria have to break the glycosidic bonds between the monomers, but they also have to break the peptide crosslinks. And this is done with enzymes called autolysins. So we're going to see in the animation here, the green autolysin is going to be breaking these glycosidic bonds in the row. And the purplish autolysin is going to be breaking the peptide crosslinks. So there we see the glycosidic bonds being broken and the peptide crosslinks being broken. And that creates a molecular gap where a new monomer can be inserted. So that's the first of the part of the synthesis, the function of the autolysis. The next part said to state the function of bactoprenols. So the bacterium has to synthesize the monomers first, and these are synthesized in the cytoplasm, in the liquid part of the cytoplasm or cytosol. And the monomers are actually assembled on a transport or carrier protein called bactoprenol. We learned about transport proteins in the previous uh, soft chalk lesson on the cytoplasmic membrane. Remember, transport proteins are what transport a substance from one side of the membrane to the other. And bactoprenols are going to transport peptidoglycan monomers from inside the bacterium to the outside where the peptidoglycan synthesis is occurring. 
So uh, there's a slideshow that shows you that process in a few steps. But if we go down to the animation here, we can see the function of bactoprenol, which is the transport protein in the cytoplasmic membrane of the bacterium. So we'll get the labeling over with here. So the peptoglycan monomers are made in the cytoplasm and are attached by energy compounds to a phosphate on the transport protein bactoprenol. So the first thing is that five amino acids are attached to the NAM, the penapeptide, by enzymes, and then an energy compound bonds that to the bactoprenol, then another energy compound binds the NAG to the NAM, Bactoprenol transports the monomer across the membrane and gets recycled so it can start assembling another peptidoglycan monomer and transferring that across the membrane. And of course, this is going on all over the bacterium. So you see the bactoprenol assembles the monomer, it transports them across the membrane. It doesn't actually leave the membrane, it just kind of flips down like that and transports it across. But by moving that, it makes it a little more visual, but notice it doesn't connect them together. It just transports them across the membrane. So the monomers are where they're supposed to be, but they're not connected to anything. The wall's still weak. So if we move on to the next part of our objective, transglycosidases. Again, glyco refers to sugar. Trans means uh, across. So if we take a look here, transglycosidase enzymes are what are going to insert and link the new peptidoglycan monomers in the breaks in peptidoglycan. They're going to form the glycosidic bonds that connects the new peptidoglycan monomer to the existing peptidoglycan to make the rho strong. And we see that in the next animation. So here's where we left off. Uh, the auto license have put a split in the wall, breaking the peptide crosslinks and the glycosidic bonds. Bactoprenol has assembled monomers and transported them across the membrane. Now transglycosidases are going to form the glycosidic bonds that hooks the new monomer into the existing peptidoglycan. And now these two monomers have been inserted and this row is one monomer longer but we still don't have these cross peptide crosslinks needed for cell wall strength formed, which brings us to the fourth and final part of that objective, the role of transpeptidase. And that refers to forming the peptide crosslink. Remember, ACE is an enzyme, so this is an enzyme that's going to insert peptides. And that forms a peptide crosslinks between the rows and between the layers of peptidoglycan to make the wall strong. And if we look at our final animation there. So again, besides just writing down the answer to the objective, make sure you look at the visuals. You wanna visualize what this is doing so you can remember it better. So uh, the bactoprenol had transported these two monomers across the membrane. Transglycosidases have formed the glycosidic bonds that have connected the new monomer to the existing peptidoglycan. Finally, transpeptidase is going to form these peptide crosslinks by connecting the amino acids coming off this NAM with the amino acids coming off the NAM in the above row. And in the process, one of these are lost providing, one of the amino acids are lost providing energy. So here comes transpeptidase forming a short peptide that connects one row with the next row like a chain link fence. And there we have the new monomer inserted and the wall resealed. And the final animation summarizes the whole process from beginning to end. So there we've answered that long double asterisk objective. And notice we have our first think pair share or TPS question. And when we have face-to-face -face lectures, we work on these in class. Since we're doing uh, synchronous Zoom lectures, uh, you'll be doing these on your own. But again, here's how you think them out. So what you want to do is look for key words first. So if we see in number one, it says the antibiotic 
bacitracin that's found in a lot of the triple antibiotic creams you can buy over the counter for cuts. It tells you that it binds to bactoprenol. So it asks, how is this going to lead to death of the bacterium? Now, again, we're looking for an, an explanation of the whole process, not just a couple words, but how does it do this? We're looking at a process. So the first thing we do, we see bacitracin binds to bactoprenol, where, where did we just talk about bactoprenol? Up here. So we learned that bactoprenol is going to assemble peptidoglycan monomers and transport them across the membrane so they can be inserted into the existing peptidoglycan. So if we look here and think about this, remember the monomer is assembled and connected to the phosphate on bactoprenol. Well, bacitracin binds here on, on the bactoprenol. And remember one of the things that I've mentioned probably a couple of times in the course is that everything in biology <coughs> at the molecular level is something having a shape that fits something else. An enzyme works because it has a shape that fits a substrate. So everything that's going on is something molecularly having a shape that fits something else. And the monomer can connect to this as it's assembled because of the shapes. Bactoprenol can transport it across because of the shape. Well, if a drug binds here, if you think about it, what's going to happen? Well, probably it's not going to be able to assemble monomers. It's not going to transport them across the membrane. So if, uh, if bactoprenol is essential for transport of monomers across the membrane and a drug binds to bactoprenol, it's probably not going to function. That function is not going to work. The monomers may not be assembled and transported across the membrane. But meanwhile, as the autolysins break the cell wall, there's no monomers being inserted because the bactoprenol is not functioning. And you're going to have a weak cell wall. Osmotic pressure is going to cause lysis, and the bacteria are going to die from osmotic lysis. Now let's look at the second TPS question. In a similar vein, penicillin is an antibiotic that binds to the bacterial enzyme transpeptidase. How will that lead to death of the bacterium? So we look for key words, penicillin binds to transpeptidase. Where did we talk about transpeptidase? <clears throat> right up here. That's the enzyme that reforms the peptide crosslinks between the rows and layers of peptidoglycan. That's needed to make the wall strong. So if we think about that, transpeptidase is going to form these peptide crosslinks between the amino acids coming off of the NAM in one row and the amino acids coming off the NAM in the next row, or between one layer and another layer. But if the drug binds to the enzyme, the transpeptidase, the enzyme is not going to function. Therefore, no peptide crosslinks are formed. As a result, the cell wall is not strong because it needs those peptide crosslinks. As water flows in, the bacterium swells with a weak cell wall, you have osmotic lysis, and the bacteria die again from osmotic lysis. And, along, and then the last part of the object, the TPS question says, could these antibiotics be used to treat protozoan infections like giardiasis and toxoplasmosis? So keep in mind, when you do these TPS questions, that's assuming you've already learned stuff from previous units. And by the time we've gotten to peptidoglycan, we've had the soft chalk lesson on prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. And we've had the three domain system of classification soft chalk lesson. So under prokaryotic, eukaryotic cells, we learned that bacteria are prokaryotic, whereas protozoans are eukaryotic. Well, we know from what we've learned about peptidoglycan and what we learned back under prokaryotic, eukaryotic cells is that peptidoglycan is found 
only in prokaryotic bacteria in the domain bacteria. So eukaryotic cells don't have peptidoglycan because they're eukaryotic. And we also learned in the three domain system that protozoans, in fact, don't even have a cell wall. Like our cells, they're just surrounded by a plasma membrane. So no, penicillin would not have any effect on those because penicillin works by binding to transpeptidase. Protozoa don't have a cell wall. Uh, and peptidoglycan is what makes up the bacterial cell wall. And even, even if they had a cell wall, it wouldn't be made of peptidoglycan because that's found only in prokaryotic bacteria. So there's nothing for the drug to bind to in a protozoan, so it would have no effect, just like it doesn't harm our cells because we don't have peptidoglycan. And of course, that could apply to a lot of things like viruses. As we learned under prokaryotic, eukaryotic cells, viruses are not cells. They're basically a protein shell surrounding a genome and maybe an envelope. But they have no cells, they have no cell wall, they have no organelles. So again, in viruses, there would be no peptidoglycan for the transpeptidase to bind to. So again, you want to think these out about what we've learned about this. Now let's check out the next objective. Uh, briefly describe how antibiotics like penicillin, cephalosporins, and vancomycins affect bacteria and relate this to cell wall synthesis. Well, we've actually kind of answered that by what we did down here in the TPS question. And so the TPS question was prior to this, so you try to work out the answer before we actually got to that section. But if we take a look here, how antibiotics affect cell wall synthesis, if we go to our table of contents, <coughs> we see antibiotic agents that inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis causing osmotic lysis. And we see here that penicillins and cephalosporins, as well as vancomycins, bind to transpeptidase. We also had that in the TPS objective. And of course, by binding to uh, transpeptidase, that prevents the peptide crosslinks from forming, causing osmotic lysis. And in fact, here's an animation that illustrates how penicillins work in this section. So again, what transpeptidase does is it forms these peptide crosslinks between the rows of sugars and between the layers of peptidoglycan to make the wall strong. But as we said, penicillins have a shape that fits transpeptidase. They bind to the bacterial transpeptidase enzyme, basically inactivating it so that it can't form peptide crosslinks. But the autolysins keep splitting the cell wall but without the peptide crosslinks, the wall is weak and osmotic pressure as the water flows in causes the membrane to swell and burst, causing osmotic lysis and death of the bacterium. And if we take a look at our remaining objectives, these are all in one section here. State what color gram positive bacteria stain after gram staining. State what color gram negative bacteria stain after gram staining. State what color acid fast bacteria stain after gram staining. So if we go to our table of contents, we see gram positive, gram negative, and acid fast bacteria. And we see that gram positive bacteria, because they retain the initial dye in the gram stain, as we'll learn in lab six, stain purple like this gram-positive staphylococcus here that stains purple. Gram-negative bacteria decolorize and lose the crystal violet. And they pick up a pink counter stain called safranin. So gram-negative stain pink, like the C. coli. And this is a gram stain of a mixture of staphylococcus aureus staining purple mixed with E. coli staining pink. Now, acid-fast bacteria which is basically the genus Mycobacterium, like the one that causes tuberculosis, don't stain well with a gram stain, but a special stain was developed for staining these called the acid fast stain. And acid fast bacteria resist decolorization with acid alcohol, 
so they retain the initial dye, which is a red or fuchsia color. So you see that acid fast bacteria stain kind of a reddish or fuchsia color after acid fast staining, whereas virtually everything else picks up a blue counter stain. And that's the answer to that objective. And of course, don't forget as you're going through each section here, I'm just showing you how to use it to answer the detailed learning objectives. But remember, pretty much all of these sections have little self quizzes along the way you can do to practice to see if you understand that section, as well as a final quiz, self quiz you can do at the end of the lesson. Now, the last thing I want to mention is use of the concept maps. Uh, pretty much every soft chalk lesson, I provided an interactive concept map that summarizes pretty much everything you need to know about that lesson in a visual way or mind map method. So if we click on the concept maps, here's the one for peptide of lichen synthesis. Now, these are especially useful for reviewing. Remember, once you read and go through the object, uh, go through the lesson. Once you answer the objectives, you have to learn those objectives. As you do new lessons, you have to keep reviewing the old lessons over and over again until you know all the material that will be on that exam. And these concept maps are another good way to do that. And they also give you visuals you can look at. Now, these don't print out well. Uh, if it's a fairly small one, you can probably read it. But if it's a larger lesson with a larger concept map, uh, it'll be too small to read on standard paper. So these work real good online, but they're not good for printing. So we start out here with peptidoglycan. And uh, one of the objectives said, name the three parts of a peptidoglycan monomer. So we see that peptidoglycan description is a polymer of interlocking peptidoglycan monomers. Peptidoglycan monomers contain two amino sugars with a pentapeptide. And we can take a look at a picture of that. And then the long rows of sugars of peptidoglycan are joined together by means of peptide cross links, which makes the wall strong. And again, there's a diagram you used to refer to the peptide cross links. So again, that pretty much sums up the stuff in the objective with visuals. Uh, the we, second part of the objective says, what is the function of peptidoglycan is to prevent osmotic lysis. How is back peptidoglycan synthesized? Our big objective, synthesis of peptidoglycan. It requires autolysins, which break the glycosidic bonds and the peptide crosslinks. And there's the animation we looked at. Bactoprenol assembles the peptidoglycan monomers, transports them across the membrane. There's the animation that summarizes that. Transglycosidases, also called transglycosidases, uh, insert the new monomers and reform the glycosidic bonds. There's the animation that summarizes that. And finally, transpeptidase forms the peptide crosslinks and the animation. And then uh, we mentioned that there are some antibiotics that inhibit the synthesis of peptidoglycan. Penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and various others inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis, causing osmotic lysis. And there's the animation of how penicillin causes osmotic lysis. And at the end of the lesson, we learned that in the domain bacteria, with a few exceptions, bacteria have a semi-rigid cell wall composed of peptidoglycan. Based on the cell walls, we can divide bacteria into three groups, gram positives, which stain purple with a gram stain, gram negatives, which stain pink with a gram stain, and acid fast bacteria, which stain red with an acid fast stain. So there you see the concept maps are another wise way, nice way to review the material. Uh, once you have it down pretty good, you've read it, you've looked at the animations and the illustrations, 
then this kind of summarizes most of the nitty gritty material there, as well as giving you visuals you can use to help you review. So that is basically how we can use the detailed learning objectives to answer, uh, to prepare a study guide from your uh, soft chalk lessons, how you can use the soft chalk lessons to answer the TPS questions or think fair share questions, and how we can use the concept maps to help learn, study, and review the material. So let me know if you have any questions on that uh, next time you see me in class or during office hours.